Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. For a few years now, we've been trying to preach to people the difficulties concerning delusions and how there are so many delusions in this life. The word plani in Greek also means error and oftentimes is translated in the services as error. Deliver us from the error of the devil, for example. That is, deliver us from the delusion of the devil. And our Lord has given us the opportunity to preach this. And the greatest weapon against delusion is repentance. And so among the many delusions, the great delusion, the great lie is that people live here as if they're going to be living here forever. And our Savior tells us, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. He teaches us that we should not live on those things which we consider to sustain us here on earth, but to think about heavenly things, to think about those things which really have meaning in life. And the delusion is, we live here as if we're going to be here forever. And we talk as if we're going to be here forever. We plan as if we're going to be here forever. And yet we know that there will come a day when we die, but we've put that somewhere in the background. We don't want to deal with it. Deluded people never want to deal with their delusions. They don't like reality. And as you've heard me say many times, our faith is the faith of reality. It tries to wake us up from this delusional culture that we live in where everybody has to pat each other on the back and tell each other how wonderful they are. And where we have become accustomed to feel sorry for ourselves as, as if we are great victims. And this happens because we've lost sight of the great victim who was not a victim, who took upon himself our sins. How can we compare to that? And yet still, people feel sorry for themselves. They've lost sight of what our Lord did for us and what he does for us and how he saves us and how he was crucified for us. And yet, we think about our back pain, or about our toothache, or about our headache, and so on and so forth. And we heard in the epistle today that Solomon built him a house. And we hear in the Old Testament, the scriptures, which we oftentimes read in the Vesper service, how dreadful is this place. This is the house of God. How awesome is this place. Full of glory is thy house, O Lord. And yet, still people don't understand that this house, where we are now, is greater in glory than the house of Solomon, the house which Solomon built for the Lord. Because we he here have the great presence of God, even physically in Holy Communion, which they didn't have in the Old Testament. And for this reason, I repeat, the prophets would have loved to see this day, wherein we live now. One of the ministries which we do here in the monastery is dealing with demoniacs. And some have passed through here, and that is a cross which they have to bear. And yesterday, one of them had a bad scene, and the fathers called me. And in the midst of this scene, where the person goes in and out, he said desperately, Yeranda, help me. And as a human being, 
I felt compassion for the person. And in today's Gospel reading, we start off with the Lord had compassion on the multitude. So I tell the fathers and the Christians that when we pray, if we pray desperately, if we pray with humility, if we really are searching for help, there's no way that the saints of God won't respond since even we, fallen human beings, feel compassion for someone when they ask for help. How much more will the saints who have been so much more purified, who have been so much more, who are so closer to God while we here on earth are still fallen. Someone has to be totally hard-hearted to see someone in peril and to not care about them. And so when we are in peril, then we pray. But you know, the devil's in the background and he says, your prayers aren't being answered. And he wants us to believe that it's as if the saints or the mother of God or the Lord himself is hard-hearted towards us. And the exact opposite is true. We are the hard-hearted ones. But we hear today in the gospel passage that the Lord had compassion on the multitudes because they were in a desert place. He didn't just have compassion on them for no reason. They were struggling. Of course, he has compassion on us as a loving creator because he knows our state and he knows what is in man and he knows what has become of man as is clearly evidenced at the resurrection of Lazarus when Jesus wept, seeing to what state man had reached. That is, the state of death, the state of stinking. Becoming a stinking corpse where man was made to rejoice in paradise. In the desert place, the people were fasting. The people were struggling. But these people, 5,000 men, that is, besides the women and children, so there were many more than just 5,000, regarded and understood the word of God which says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And so it's as if they were mesmerized. It's as if they were taken into a trance. It was as if, and truly it was, that they were pulled by the word of God, that is, by God himself, who came to earth, to raise men on high, and who showed us a way of salvation by means of the cross, by means of struggle, by means of fasting, by means of going into a deserted place. The desert can symbolize also in catalipsis, that is, abandonment. God forsakenness, St. John of the Latter says, where at times we feel as if God is not there, but he is there, and he has compassion on us. It's like a parent who tries to teach the little child how to walk. But if the, if the parent walks for the child, if he's the one that helps the child along the way the whole time, the child will be too dependent. He needs to learn how to walk on his own. And so he'll walk from point A to point B. And naturally, especially at the very beginning, he'll stumble. He will trip. He will fall. He's still trying to learn how to stand straight on his legs. <clears throat> so in this deserted place, our Savior had compassion on these people. And the apostles said we should send them away. Where this is a deserted place, the day is far spent. There was fear that they would faint along the way. And our Savior says something totally impractical from a human perspective. He says, give them to eat. Now, if we look at this literally, 
as we said, it doesn't make any sense. But our Savior already commands his disciples to preach the word, to give to the faithful to eat, to give them nourishment, to awaken them. And he does this by the fish and the bread. For the apostles say, the disciples of Jesus Christ say to him, we have here only but two fishes and five loaves. But we must recall that when our Savior called the apostles, when he called them to become disciples of him, he said to them, I will make you fishers of men. You will catch men. So they bring to him the two fishes and the five loaves, and our Lord blesses them, and they break the bread, and they passed it on. And there was order in the desert, People were sitting in companies and they partook of this nourishment which our Lord gave to them. Imagine such a great multitude of people listening to the Word of God. Uh, they must have been very silent. They must have been very quiet. They must have been very attentive. And for this reason, I say it again and I'll never stop saying it. If we're in church and we're not paying attention, where are we? Do we realize who is speaking to us? Why is the scenario so different from that time? And actually, there is a difference. Our Lord has accomplished all things. He sent His Holy Spirit. There is apostolic succession in the church. We have the holy mysteries with us. It is different. Now we have everything, and yet our attention is lost. One of the saints who celebrates today is the blessed fool for Christ's sake, Maximus of Moscow, who is it? St. Basil. St. Basil of Moscow, who was a contemporary of Ivan the Terrible. And one time Ivan the Terrible was in church in Russia, and the blessed fool for Christ's sake went to him and told him, you weren't in church, because while he was, while the Trubikim was being chanted, he was thinking about how he would decorate his palace. And so the fool for Christ's sake specifically told him that and said, when we chant, let us lay aside all earthly care, you're thinking about decorating your palace. And then the saint moved away and left. And Ivan the Terrible started to reverence this fool for Christ's sake, Basil of Moscow. So the same thing can be said of us when our minds are far away, when our hearts are far away. And the sad thing is we say it all the time, and yet it's so difficult for us to remember these words. And it's because we are the ones that are fooled, that are in delusion, that are in the midst of this whirlwind of thoughts, which are demons nestling in the heart, which are trying to pull us away from God and trying to take away the seed of righteousness, as we hear in the parable of the sower. Knowing the evil one knows the profit we can receive. And so even now, he tries to take away the seed, and he fights the word. But we must open our hearts and our minds to hear. We had the example of what we heard from Basil, the fool for Christ's sake, of Moscow, who teaches us that there are people who are in church that are physically present but spiritually far away. We've also heard in many examples of the lives of the saints that there are people who are not physically present but who are present in spirit. <clears throat> and that's particularly what can happen when people pray with us at the same time. Now we have these means where we have, of course, the live stream. But I remember growing up in Toronto, a pious tradition which was handed down to us from my grandmother. 
who was a blessed soul. May we have our prayers. Whenever church was taking place, this they took from the village. If the Christians could not make it to church that day because of, for one reason or another, because of work or because of taking care of the household, whatever it would have been, no one would eat until church was over. You'd be reminded that even though you can't make it to church, you must pray still. Neither would they take on Didron and holy water until they knew that the church service was over. They would fast the whole time and then they'd take on Didron and holy water. And this is how they trained themselves to be Christians. It was a Christ-centered life. And the Christians should do that. If for one reason or another one cannot be in church, one should pray and he can possibly find himself in church. St. Nectarius of Aegina, together with so many saints, as we said, mentioned how someone could be working in the field and yet they could be in church. In other examples, in the Kiev Caves Patricon, we find somebody being sensed while they were not there, while they were actually not physically in church. And although it is a dogmatic issue for us to be together, epito afto, in one place, in the same place, we can still find ways where we can connect by economia. It is an economia. There are people who are trying to make it the norm, and there are people who are falling for a trap of just being lazy, staying at home and perhaps putting on their live stream, and that's not good either. There are others who have gone further. In some local churches of the modernist jurisdictions, we hear that they're thinking about putting bread and wine in front of the screen during the liturgy and thinking that it might be body and blood of Christ, which is blasphemous. That's impossible. But in spirit, we can try to connect. We can be present. So let us be present, my beloved Orthodox Christians, so that we can hear the word of God, which brings us salvation. And once again, let us remind ourselves that we should not live here as if we're going to be here forever, as if we're trying to find our place. Our place is with God. And you must see, as St. Isaac the Syrian says, the hand of God in your life. You must see God's providence in your life. And you shall know them by their fruits when you are in peace and when you pray to the Master. Then you will see and you will be thankful. But when we are far away from God and when we are are not prayerful and when we are in the midst of our judgmental fallen state where we like to judge people and exalt ourselves, we get we fall into the temptation of distraction, but also of confusion. Confusion. We are confused because we are far away from God. We murmur. We complain. Those are the fruits. Those are the fruits which should tell you you're not in the right place, you're not in the right state. And so you'll see that when you are closer to God, when you have more peace, everything is agreeable and you see God's providence in your life. May our Lord nourish us with his word and help us to be participants in this Holy Eucharist and deem us worthy to pray to him from the depths of our hearts, to not live the lie, but to prepare ourselves for the next life where we will be able to glorify him unceasingly. But in this life, let us pray that we will be able to cultivate holiness in our hearts. And let us pray that the All-Holy Spirit come down and enter into us and cleanse us of every impurity so that our souls be saved. Amen.